You know, if there were two big ideas that have a pretty much equal <coughs> weight, it seems to me, in this whole subject, they are humankind discovers an inexhaustible new source of energy, and humankind invents the means of its own destruction. And in a sense, Los Alamos, I, I mean, the Manhattan Project is a subset of that big idea. I don't mean that that's the big idea that's going to draw crowds, or they aren't. I just mean we're not really talking about doing a historical exhibition on the Manhattan Project, I don't think. I think we're talking about this rather larger and deeper and more fundamental thing that changed. And it was manifested during this historical period in the Manhattan Project. That explains why you could have some of the science. Mm -hmm. It explains why you feel the need to go beyond the Second World War. I just wanted to add, I mean, of course, you know, as soon as you put down two, someone wants to add three. I just, I'm mindful that, um, I was thinking also about Angela's presentation again that I keep coming back to because uh, one is that people found this unending source of energy, but it was also something else, which it had this other value for humans, which was diagnostic, medical, health-related, and other things that weren't just about energy. Right. So the positive and the negative. I'm also mindful, too, that I don't know if this is true empirically, that the so many of these, um, that people are so interested in biology. They're interested yeah. in their own bodies, yeah. their own yeah. biological right. systems. That's right. why Bobby rules. Right. And that the, right. the physics, right. And the yeah. physics yeah. world is not so compelling to people. I mean, sometimes it is for kids, like how does a bubble get, you know, what does a bubble look like or something. But I'm also thinking, too, about the biological aspects of this. Um, maybe they could be brought in and some way sure. because that is compelling. And I think yeah. that it may be true for most ages. Angela. I was just going to add that I think the other thing that a lot of people are interested in are environmental aspects. Yeah. Yeah. This is really, really interesting. And um, I think we often think of the Manhattan District and the AEC as the causes of environmental problems rather than being the nurseries of environmental science. Yeah, great. Um, and great. I mean, part of why I presented the material I did is that I do think that there are opportunities to tell new stories about the legacy of the bomb and not mm -hmm. just represent the old stories in a different way. And um, yeah, I, I, I would love to see that happen, but I don't know anything about presenting things in a so this is this is um, making me wonder is is the Manhattan Project is part of this exhibit, but it's not the exhibit. And and maybe if we if we start doing something with our vocabulary, like yeah. like you're suggesting, and we, yeah. we stop doing an exhibit on the Manhattan Project, but, but of some of the aspects of the Manhattan Project are, become illustrative of some bigger ideas yeah. that that yeah. carried out over the second half of the 20th or the second two thirds of the of the 20th century and on into today. You know, if I were thinking of the entrance to the exhibit, I would have a full-scale re replica of Little Boy next to some biological or a scanner or a CAT scan machine or something. There would be, and, and in a sense it embodies the good and the evil, the destructive and the constructive, all of those fundamental yin-yang things yeah. that are there would be embodied in that sort of machinery. So, so is the title yin-yang. <laughs> if, if, yin if I could just present a, a totally heretical notion and, and just have it thrown out right away. Um, what about the possibility of what I would call a living exhibit? And what I mean by this is, I, I don't know if any of you have seen Lawrence Krauss and, and Brian Green speak on, um, uh, on on the origins of the universe and uh, the armchair discussion that they do, which, by the way, for those of you who have seen it or don't already know, it's, it's all pretty well choreographed, although it looks very, very casual. It's fantastic, in my opinion. It's fantastic. Now, if, if you use the backdrop of a science center and, or, or any other museum and you launch this in a living way, because what I'm most interested in what I found most fascinating about what I've heard in these discussions are things that I knew absolutely nothing about coming from the science point of view. The idea that this was the origins of what is what we could call our security state and, and the beginnings of all kinds of concepts about the way we approach society and the way we look at society 
is utterly fascinating to me and probably does not lend itself to anything you could put into an exhibit. But you launch a discussion on the right platform and your leave behinds can be can be more piecemeal and people might will, will come back and revisit some of those components. But I, somehow or another, I think you've got to have a living component of this that, that, that brings it all together. So, so you, you have your, your Manhattan Legacy Initiative that travels, led by probably the people in this room, quite frankly, who help bring this to life. You don't need actors to do that. You need you guys you know, who, who know this and bring it to life. And then your leave behind comes from that. I don't know how you would ever convey as much as you all conveyed in a couple of days in an exhibit. Yeah. I, you know, there, there's so many aspects of this. I'm just thinking, the thing travels around, it's different everywhere. To because show. in mm -hmm. Arizona, you mm -hmm. pull in Lawrence Krauss. Mm -hmm. A lot of the scientists were, yeah. were, were cosmic scientists. I mean, they were looking at gamma rays. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of <clears throat> them were involved with with yeah. outer space, and 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 you could just you could start with here they're looking at outer space. Now we're looking. I mean, you could kind of make some connections. Go ahead. Well, yeah, just along those lines. Last <coughs> year in May, so I chaired. Actually, you know, Dick Rhodes play Reykjavik, so FAS was <coughs> uh, co-host at Stanford's Business School. Beautiful auditorium, not aud uh, night auditorium. We had a pretty good turnout both nights. Then right after showing in the play, you know, I chaired a session. Uh, one night it was was Dick and Phil Taubman, and then we had uh, Sid Drell. So we had noted you know, playwrights, historians, scientists, talking about this, not just the play, but the implications. And it's like, I really agree with Bud. This really has to, I think, be living history. Right? And you can invite, like you're saying, right. depending where it, where it goes, you can invite noted scientists, historians uh, to, to come in and have even special nights where or special events. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then record them, and yeah. then those get left. You can have these a lot of leave behind right. from this. Your exhibit can be being constructed <laughs> yes, as you travel, so. mm -hmm. and then and then at the end of some period of time after it travels, you've got a lot of leave behind material that, um, that you can compile. So is that anything? Let's say you have. Um, a great leave behind, you know, some great exciting performance. Can you, would it be like a big screen and then you can, I mean, can you use it again in a museum oh, or oh, is that? Oh yeah, and it yeah. doesn't have to be a big yeah. screen. Right. I mean, I mean we, we do this at the Science Museum in Minnesota does a great job with little modules and, and they, those modules are placed strategically in various places mm -hmm. in the museum. It's almost where you need a break and, and boom, there you are mm -hmm. and you're, you know, you're getting a you know, piece mm -hmm. of, a, of a, a presentation that's fantastic. That's right. Or it lives online. I mean, I would assume oh, that's going to be a fabulous yeah. Yeah. online right. component mm -hmm. for this right. as well. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. So maybe this is, is kind of a new approach to exhibit. You start with a little thing, and then it snowballs out <laughs> 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 around the country. Instead of attach on pieces, yeah, you, you invite get a folder, yeah. you have another wing. And <laughs> invite, friend, invite friends and colleagues throughout the country to add to it, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Well, you can get that little glass cyclotron that's about this big that I think is at the Smithsonian these days. There was the first cyclotron. And then you can go to a bomb. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think if you think in the context of history and, and science again, that, that Mac and Kelly just gave us the title of the exhibit, and that is the Manha Manhattan Project Legacies, the Positive and the Negative. Mm. Yeah. Our, the atom, right friend there, or right? foe. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the atom, the atom positive, and and negative. positive and negative, <laughs> and sometimes neutral. It's a wrap. I think, though, you know, depending on, you might think it's good or bad or whatever, you know, depending on different points of view. And I, I'm hard pressed to find any particular outcome that everybody would agree was absolutely horrendous, except for some of the medical experiments, which I think people would agree. But mostly everything else, you might have people saying, it's great that we have a security state. It's great that we have all these weapons yeah. hanging around. Absolutely. Right? There are plenty of people with yeah. those views. Sure. The NRA to sponsor it. But yeah, the NRA would be something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then there are some things. Again, I think there's just a limited number that people would say absolutely horrendous. And how could people have done such a thing? But 
the, in the main, there there are things. I mean, I'm thinking again of themes. Like, so what are the legacies of it? And some of the legacies are lots of weapons, a security state, and that can be represented in different ways. So again, I'm not sure everybody's going to be super compelled by the security state as much as I am. Um, but there could be other things sort of like that about its legacies and giving people some sense of what it's like. What was it like to build the thing? What were they trying to do? What was life like there? What problems did they have to solve? And then other things about, well, what happens beyond that? Now, we have this new source of energy, this new source of seeing and visualization, this new thing that people, because they're scientists, they put to all kinds of uses that, I mean, before today, I didn't know about the environmental stuff that Angela talked about. But this is helps people to see science as something creative. People take this stuff and do different kinds of things with it. And there are other questions, too, about who should manage this, what should they do. I don't have great <laughs> ideas about exactly, but I guess I keep thinking of what are like the three themes, the four themes, the couple of themes that will be put forth about once we get the things in place. I, th I think uh, one of the themes we haven't talked too much about, we've got in glancingly, is this just the whole drama of this, the individual, I think in Dr. Atomic, you know, this kind of thing, that mm -hmm. those kind of debates that go on, and people like Oppenheimer talking about is technically sweet. Well, there's this uh, aesthetic side versus the, uh, mm -hmm. but I think the human drama yeah. does drive people uh, to these kinds of things. And there's lots of stories of tragedy and, you know, uh, and so on going on in this. But the human stories, of, I think, you know, even telling some of Oppenheimer's story in here. And so I, I just, really think, I agree. I really think that the exhibit itself, much the way one writes history, has to be strictly objective has to present the facts, the information, and then can be surrounded by a penumbra of, of these conflicts and disagreements and so forth. But the, the fact is the atomic, the atom good and bad is not what we should be doing. We should be doing the atom. We should be doing, I mean, in a way, this is a standard story of the introduction of a new technology into the world. It had intended consequences. It had unintended consequences. That's really the basis for Bohr's whole discussion about the whole thing. The unintended consequences, he hoped, would swamp the intended consequences, which they did, in the sense that they put an end to world-scale war, evidently, except for suicidal explosions. So. It's not a bad title, unintended consequences. <laughs> well, even that's judgmental. It is. In a sense. I mean, it implies judge, judgment for the people who would look at it. I just think if we give, if we present compellingly these things we've talked about and let the people who are looking at it draw their conclusions as they will, but not to, not to, not to lead them by saying, well, here was a bad thing that happened. Right. What about, I mean, science as a double-edged sword? I mean, that's a common way to look at it. But is it really science, or is it science and then the humanitarian? I mean, the, you know, the applicators make it the sword double-edged. I don't know. But it, but it is true. I mean, well, look, everything that can be made into a tool can be made into a weapon. Right. Or I should say tools are weapons, and weapons can be tools. You can use a sword to, to dig and cut an apple out of the tree to feed yourself. But it's not the same standard, standard Kubrick. To I so the thing to do is to talk to about the technology of the of the sword. I, I worry a little bit when we try to when we try to split too carefully. You know, science good bad. Um, yeah. It's just too murky. But there's a, there's another nuance on it that I find interesting. And I, the only way I can describe it is is discovery with intent. There's a, if you ask young people about what is discovery, they, they have a sense of, of, of we stumble onto things. Um, sometimes sometimes we, we stumble onto them because we, we set out purposefully to look for them. And, and so it, p people tend to make a sharp distinction between the Einsteins of the world and the Edisons of the world, you know, and say, well, you know, there are discoverers and there are inventors. This is bringing it all together much more tightly, uh, purposeful, the discovery with intent, um, and, and, and 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 were the intentions met, you know, or were they or were they you know ultimately seen in a in a different light? I think I, it, it's it's to me a little bit more comfortable way of saying science is going to be good under any circumstances. We're not going to not engage in science, but but the process um, is a little less clear than we might. 
than we might think. But I think that's also good because I think there's a sense of inevitability of history and you might say the science did research. You don't do research knowing the outcome. It was not inevitable. <coughs> this all came together, certainly by the time of the end of the war. Yeah. Um, Seems like a strange discussion to me because we're talking about a project that was designed to build bombs. You know, it wasn't a lot of... To what purpose? But, but to what purpose? To kill as many people as no, we could with the, with the, the, the assumption. Well, the original assumption was as a deterrent against a German bomb. Exactly. And that then, was the initial assumption, and yeah. Then, to uh, end a war. Yeah, but then it turns into war. something else. Well, in, well, I don't know if it did or not. The purpose was always to end the war. Well, that was one of the purpose. That's Whether one of the debates that, that's one of the debates the that we're having. It was not how many people can we kill, or we would have used the bomb in a very different way from the way we did use it. It was deliberately designed to reduce the amount of radioactivity it produced on the ground. If we wanted to kill more people, we would have dropped it in the dirt. We also wanted to show the effects of the bomb as visually and dramatically. And if you look at which what, Oppenheimer what, what, said would what, just be a big firecracker. What, what Gro- but no, but Groves in his targeting says explicitly as visually dramatic uh, sure. a display sure. as possible. Yes. That, that was right. and because because okay. we're sending does that a have message. To do with killing? Hmm? And what does that have to do with killing a lot of what people? What does it not have to do with killing? It's a visual display. As to, to show the power of the bomb as dramatically as to possible. To show the power of the bomb, why? In order to Shock convince the leadership of Japan to stop Shock fighting. Well, I well, we disagree about that. I think it's also to uh, send a, a powerful message to the Soviet Union. Well, I'm sure it was that too. Yeah. And My so, point so is the intent of this weapon was not to see how many people you can kill. The intent of this weapon was to try to end a war where people were being killed. The fact that in order to do that, you killed a lot of people, <laughs> unfortunately, was part of the story. But that was not the purpose. I know, I know. This is uh, the living exhibit, right? right. Yes. You want to talk about how to kill a lot of people, you have to look at the death camps in Nazi Germany. There, the intent was simply to kill as many Jews as possible, and they got quite good at it. Well, I, I would say, let's even take it back further to the other point you were making about the uh, strategic bombing. And what LeMay said explicitly was the way you end the war LeMay is by, said, by, kill, right, by killing as many people intent. as possible. That was then, LeMay's then you kill intent. Enough, that was then, not then, necessarily then, then, then it ends. the Manhattan Project's intent or even General Marshall's intent. But the Manhattan Project's intent was not to develop uh, nuclear energy for, this, for peaceful well, uses. Well, actually, as it happened, they were working on that too, but that's another that, But that was not the purpose. No, that was not no. the purpose. I mean, the purpose was initially to uh, initially as a deterrent against the German bomb and then after Germany's out of the war then it's to drop it on Japan and to in some people's mind end the war as quickly as possible in other people's minds to send a message to, I dare to the say Soviet both, Union. actually yeah. in all cases but mm-hmm. be that as it may the intent was not to just to kill a lot of people but to demonstrate that you had the potential to. No, but the intent was to send a message to the Japanese leadership that their country would be utterly destroyed if they didn't surrender. By the intent wasn't to utterly destroy yeah, the by killing a lot by killing a lot of people. So it's, it's demonstrating the intent, the capacity to kill a lot of people. Well, except there was a except there was a persistent self-deception amongst the well, targeting indeed. committee. Indeed, uh, uh, sure. You know that this was actually suitable against a military target. Yes, and they, I think blinded themselves to the. Well, fact. I think quite deliberately. I mean, the fact is, we'd already, as I said before, settled that debate. Right. We'd found a rationale for, for based on the fact that we couldn't hit the broadside of a barn with our bombing in 1943 for, for bombing large areas, which was all we could do. And in that sense, the atomic bomb was. But even that, the intent wasn't just to kill people and burn down cities. Well, well let me the just tell you one other way. Uh, Admiral Leahy. Admiral Leahy. He doesn't qualify. Uh, he was not involved. Well, he was Truman's personal chief of staff. Yeah. And he chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Yeah. When he was asked by Daniels, who was interviewing him after the war, uh, he says, uh, Truman said we were going to use it. Uh, as a military weapon, said then we went ahead and killed as many women and children, which is what we wanted from the very beginning. Uh, well, that's Leahy's. I mean, maybe you Ex don't agree with that. Ex post facto does yeah. not really count, I'm afraid. Well, I, I think it counts. But I, but to me, the, the, the implication is gets into something you had suggested in the beginning. And that's that one of the outcomes of this was the possibility of ending life on the planet. 
Yeah. A long-term consequence. I've been to the uh, A-bomb Museum in Hiroshima over 20 times, and I would find that uh, time after time I would write one thing down to make sure I didn't forget it, and that's that by 1985 we had developed the destructive capability equivalent to 1.47 million Hiroshima bombs. And as Stan knows, it actually we developed that even earlier, as he's yeah. as he's shown. Yeah. Uh, and to me, and and to sh uh, so what I would like to stress in this would be from the very beginning, we understood that capability existed. As when Oppenheimer briefs him on May 31st, he says, within three years we're going to have weapons 10 to 100 megatons in destructive capability. And Teller was thinking along these lines. Truman says this repeatedly that we can end life on the planet. So that element, uh, I think, should be... You know, that end life on the planet was an old cliché about nuclear energy. Hitler made a joke about it with, with uh, Speer when he was talking with him about whether or not they should work on the bomb. It had been a joke all the way back to the first discoveries of radioactivity. It's not a very oh, funny the scientists joke, want to blow up the world. Right. Yes, we have those novels and plays. Now, they, and now of course, lines. you're right. They had found a way to do so. Goes back. Yes, way back. But Truman says this a number of occasions. Yeah. So, on some, so on some level, he understood the process he was beginning, and the scientists understood to the extent they allowed themselves to think about the process they were beginning. And so the implications of that, I think, are very powerful for... This is a question about their sense of control, not about their sense of let's build something that will blow up the world. <laughs> They weren't in the business of blowing up no, the world. No, they didn't want to, of course. No one was in the business of blowing up the world, or we would have blown it up long ago. Everyone saw a different function for this weapon, this energy. And, and that's the interesting thing, yeah. that we would develop something and use it knowing the door we were opening. We do that all that. the time. This is a question of no, the unintended I think this is the consequences first time, of technology. But I think that's what makes this so different from other things, that this for the first time gave us the capability to end life on the planet. Indeed. And so that's, I think, the, uh, the one of the subtexts of this has to be that. You remember what I said. Yeah, Mankind invents the means of its own destruction. Yes, I agree. Yeah. It's one of the two but that's not the only purpose of this discovery, what? nor was it the intended use of the weapons. Anyway, we've we've gone yeah, round and yeah. round. Yeah, this won't be controversial at all. Don't worry, guys. I think you've got your exhibit. You've got your exhibit right here. Yeah. 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 Um, it would be fair to say that while people were developing a bomb, that people quickly recognized and were developing more I and mean, more weapons. So it would be not. It would be. I mean, we. Get, I'm not a historian who can call up April 15th or I'm thinking about taxes. Sorry. But you know, a specific date for something uh, around those issues. But it does seem that the um, talking about one bomb and then the quick development of yeah. multiple bombs by the U.S. and then the worries and concerns about everybody else starting to should also be part of the story. I still have trouble comprehending how many, what size this was. I went and looked at your fabulous nightmare-giving site, um, but <laughs> none, nonetheless wonderful. But I still have trouble getting my head around exactly how many of these things are out there. And even representing something like that visually, what does this look like? Yeah. There's, and what is the firepower of all Well, and all that stuff was pre-nuclear winter, of course. Yeah. I, I, this, you only yeah. need about 20 of these guys, and that takes care of all of us, the truth, truth but, be told. But that story can also be told, too, not just as the apocalyptic nightmare that nobody wants to look at, because we also know but things are really scary. Let me go back. Just, just one fact to throw into this discussion, which I think is very important. When Oppenheimer went round to the universities to collect up the people to take to Los Alamos, he was not allowed to tell them what the purpose of this was. So he had to think of some other way to explain to them why they should give up their jobs and go to this weird place. What he told them was, "This I can't tell you what this work is, but it will probably end this war, and it may end all wars. That, now, that was too optimistic. It didn't end all wars. It had its, certainly it had its effect on large-scale war. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. But he did not go into this business. None of these guys went into this business with the possible exception of Curtis LeMay, hoping he could kill a lot of people. I, I agree with you about LeMay. That was his plan, no question. Anyway. Are, are these questions we're still struggling with today? Yeah. So why shouldn't this be 
part of the exhibition, right? Oh, this is so. this is. I mean, look yeah. how the conversation it gra should. gravitated yeah, yeah. to that. But yeah. I mean, yeah. it could be for an argument for yeah. arms control. I mean, it could have that kind of. Could also advocacy. be an argument about using drones, as we are now I mean, dealing it with today. It seems like such a center of gravity yeah. in this exhibit, yeah. and it's it's right on the table today, just as it has been the proliferation of arms races.